so good evening to uh, members and guests here in the council chamber uh, and to members of the committee and members of the public watching on YouTube. Uh, welcome to the third meeting of the recovery from the pandemic scrutiny panel, uh, which tonight is focusing on local jobs provision. Um, I especially welcome Ambrose Koshi from HS2, uh, who's present here physically tonight. Um, the agenda for the meeting, including which includes most of the presentations, is on the Ealing Council website. So if, as a member of the public, you Google Ealing Democracy, you will be able to navigate to the agenda from there. Um, this is a hybrid meeting. In order for it to be quorum, there need to be at least three members of the committee present physically, and I can see that is the case. Uh, given that this is pretty much the last council meeting before Christmas, I've provided some mince pies for those physically present, so uh, please help yourselves. Um, I'm afraid those online will have to provide their own. Um, so turning to the agenda, we begin with item one, apologies for absence. Um, I've received none. Have you had anything? Mm -hmm. There have been no apologies for absence. No apologies. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, item two, urgent matters. There are none. Uh, item three, matters to be considered in private, there are none. Uh, item four, declarations of interest, I think, Councillor Martin. Yes, Chair, there may be reference towards the High Street Task Force, which uh, obviously I chair. Great, and that's a, a non-prejudicial uh, Absolutely. Great, thank you. And there's nothing else from anyone online in terms of interests, I think. Uh, so item five, uh, minutes of the last meeting. Uh, I'll go through that 12 pages. I'll go through that in the traditional way. So we start with page one and page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, page 10, page 11, and finally page 12. So nobody uh, said anything during that. Um, and so can I uh, just have a vote to uh, agree those uh, minutes as a correct record? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. That's agreed. Um, right. Uh, so now we're on to the, uh, the main item for tonight, uh, item six, local jobs provision. And um, what I'm going to do is take all the presentations and then ask for questions from the panel at the end. Um, Diana uh, Skwarva Chowska, hope we got that right, uh, will be sharing uh, the sc her screen for the slides uh, for most of the presentations. Uh, and I'm first going to call on Fiona Crean, Interim Head of Business Growth and Investment, uh, who will I think do the first part. Yes. yes. Fiona. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, Fiona. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Fiona Crehan. I joined Ealing Council at the end of June this year and took over from Carol Sam. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about this evening is the work we've been doing with our colleagues in skills and employment and other teams in the council. Um, to deliver on the Council's 10,000 Good New Jobs Manifesto Commitment. So just go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Delivering on 10,000 uh, Good New Jobs, the, the target is split with 7,000 jobs target with our skills and employment colleagues and 3,000 with business growth. In order to deliver on that target, We've been doing a lot of work um, scoping out the approach, developing relationships, discussing plans uh, and working out the details of how we're going to achieve that. Um, two posts have been created, which are, are shared jointly between skills and employment and business growth. We've recruited one person to, the, to those jobs uh, and they started actually just last week. Um, in order to identify the job opportunities, uh, we've had a, a series of meetings with a range of different teams in the council to identify how we're going to work together, what the opportunities are, so essentially we can work smart with how we support different kinds of business sectors uh, and uh, identify where the different opportunities are. 
Um, there's a lot of work that our regeneration colleagues have been doing, looking at employment space and the physical needs of business to enable them to grow. Um, we have businesses who have plans to expand, but they're constrained by the premises they're located in uh, and need additional space. So working with our physical regeneration colleagues, um, they've been doing some scoping work to identify how can we enable that growth and enable businesses to access the employment space they need as part of those plans. We're also working with sustainability team on a range of net zero agenda programs the council has that need suppliers to, do, uh, to respond to retrofit uh, and other um, works programs. This offers a great opportunity for local businesses to get a share in that market, particularly as the construction sector is um, the second highest cluster of businesses we have uh, in the Ealing Borough. There's also a range of arts and culture organisations and um, my team, along with others, are contributing to the cultural manifesto and the action plan to deliver on that and how we can, um, how that can be part of the regeneration and, uh, and, and jobs agenda in the borough. We have a range of different challenges that businesses face as well with, uh, for example, improving their food hygiene rating so they can get on online platforms and, and promote their offer to the market. Uh, so joint working with environmental health is looking at how we can put resource and support in place to help businesses improve their operating standards and get regraded so they, they increase and improve their food hygiene rating. Um, is work with strategic property, looking at underused spaces and assets in the council and how that can also accommodate um, uh, employment space and support startups. And of course, um, really good start with joint working with procurement, looking at how the council goes about purchasing, um, particularly um, looking local first when it comes to sourcing suppliers and how my team along with others can help with brokering and matching to enable that to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's some really great sterling work that the High Streets Task Force has carried out, uh, chaired by Councillor Martin, uh, since 2020, looking at supporting recovery. And under that group, there's a couple of um, key business stakeholders that have access to networks of businesses. So the, the task force is bringing together different stakeholders to look at place-based uh, improvement plans and how we can support businesses. Uh, with plans in, um, being progressed to engage new business groups and support the setup of new business associations in different parts of the borough. Uh, we've recently uh, funded a business award with West London Chamber of Commerce. We're actively working with affordable workspace providers and there's really good joint working with um, OPDC um, around the creative enterprise zone uh, and how we're supporting creative businesses in the Park Royal area. Um, West London Business is also supporting and working with us on some high growth businesses uh, that received ARG grants recently. Uh, and we've recently held a joint event with the University of West London with our uh, built environment uh, businesses. Um, there's also really good work with um, West London College looking at green skills um, uh, and, and how the, the green skill hub plans are shaping uh, and active engagement with Imperial College in Brunel around innovation aspects of our local economy and how we can support that growth uh, with an innovation uh, proposal for, for Greenford. Uh, next slide, please. So currently in the in the borough, we have 19, 000, just over 19 and a half thousand uh, businesses and uh, directly employed 128,000 businesses. In order to engage with those businesses on scale, uh, we need to consider how we can work smart with that. So, so we can support businesses with their recruitment and growth plans, but do it on as large a scale as possible. Uh, and in this sense, we're on identifying their recruitment needs and exploring how we can help them um, with, with matching. And this is where we have a really good beginnings of joint working with the skills and employment colleagues. To enable that engagement on scale with businesses, we're, we've started setting up a number of business sector focused forums 
uh, with the first event held at the end of November, and that was the joint event with uh, the University of West London, looking at the built environment. So it brought together retrofit businesses and different kinds of contractors so we can start a dialogue with those businesses about how we can support them, what their needs are, and also what they're interested in as well. Um, there's other sector events that we're planning, but they'll take place in the new year. Uh, and one particular sector is wholesale manufacturing and logistics, because th they have some really strong allied interests. Um, and building on the Creative Enterprise Zone network, um, and we're about to commission um, or appoint a, a provider to uh, create a platform um, in the Park Royal Creative Enterprise Zone area with potential to then build that so it becomes borough wide. Um, through the High Streets Task Force, uh, we've started uh, scoping out work of how we support hospitality, retail and tourism related businesses. And that, again, will we'll, um, build with an events programme in the new year. Sorry, I just need to take a drink. <laughs> um, <clears throat> We're also, with our Regen colleagues, uh, creating lists of uh, businesses looking for space and providers who could offer meanwhile space so we can do some matching up uh, as a short term measure to help unlock access to employment space. Uh, and with community networks, looking at how we can support business startup, particularly targeting local women who are underrepresented in the business networks, how we can support and nurture entrepreneurship among those furthest from the labor market. And this builds on Christie's work with um, the startup uh, school that, that uh, began in uh, September and follows the academic year. So we're looking at how we can add to that and reach more people that, might, uh, uh, that need support with developing their enterprise idea. Um, in parallel with the dialogue with employers, we're also uh, promoting this uh, registration with the London Living Wage. In the borough, we currently have 45 employers that are registered uh, with uh, the Living Wage Foundation. Uh, and as part, another aspect of uh, manifesto commitment is to reach to 200 businesses uh, that sign up in the uh, current four-year administration. So we've started the campaign uh, to encourage more registration and look at how we can incentivize, incentivize businesses to offer the living wage or to, to celebrate those who are already doing it but not, and not actually accredited. Um, the council also has an allocation under the UK Shared Prosperity Fund um, for business support and advice. Um, and we're currently uh, awaiting the funding agreement from the GLA, but we've completed the paperwork. And by the early new year, hopefully by the end of January, that will be signed and we'll be able to get into delivery and, and, and spending on that funding. Uh, so that's just over 2 million that we have. Uh, of which 500,000 is for business support to support startup, but also to support existing businesses. And the approach we're taking with that, which has strong support from local businesses, is looking at a series of, of events and topics that businesses need help with and are interested in, um, and looking at uh, brokering so we bring businesses together to enable access to market opportunities. Um, so this builds on strong joint working, as I said earlier, across council teams with our local stakeholders. So together we are much more than the sums of our parts and together we can deliver on the council's commitment to unlock new job opportunities uh, and have a range of different um, uh, kind of work streams for how we achieve that. So I think that's the end of my slides. Oh, right. <laughs> more. so just a quick summary of the different um, initiatives and funding streams we've got in place. Um, just at the end of last year, last financial year, uh, there was a number of uh, local businesses with growth potential who were awarded ARG grants. They're now delivering on that and that's unlocking job opportunities. 
uh, but that will be achieved over a three year period. Uh, there's also the Creative Enterprise Zone, as I've mentioned, UK Shared Prosperity, uh, and also a, a local stakeholder won 100,000 from the GLA's High Street Challenge Fund. And just two weeks ago, they launched their circular economy store in a vacant council unit on Churchville Road in Acton. Uh, and they're developing really strong joint working arrangements uh, with um, creative businesses in the Park Royal area. Uh, to provide demonstrators for young people to learn about making things and what's involved in that and, and also demonstrate the principles of the circular economy. I think that is my last slide then. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you Fiona. Um, so uh, now we move on to uh, apprenticeship provision, uh, which I think is going to be delivered by um, Nazreen Kauza uh, and also uh, Diana instead of uh, Benita Nichols. Is that right? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Sorry, I thought yes, my uh, screen has frozen. Thank you, Chair. Right. Diane is going to present this back on behalf of Benita. Benita is um, around. She's just not feeling too well, but she will take um, any questions at the end when, after the guest speakers have also presented as well. So I'll hand over to Diana. Thank you, Chair. Hi, good evening. Um, thank you so much, Naz. Um, so Ealing Council and Apprenticeships. Um, Ealing Council um, has recognised the value of apprenticeships and has run its internal apprenticeship scheme since 2007. And due to the uh, eligibility at the time between 2007 and 2016, the scheme was open to young people aged 16 to 24. And from 2017, the eligibility opened up to include people of all ages. And to date, since, since the scheme opened in 2007, um, we have um, recruited 295 people, of which 284 uh, were young people aged 16 to 24 and 11 were aged uh, 25 plus. And the scheme has been an excellent route for people to start their own, uh, to start their working lives. Uh, the apprenticeship model recognises the need for participants to gain practical work experience and gain the professional knowledge, behaviours and values needed in a professional environment. And only when the apprentices have achieved uh, the as part of their apprenticeship standard, they can be put forward uh, to the endpoint assessment to, to demonstrate their competence in their role. And the national apprenticeship retention rate as of 2021 is 65%, and Ealing Council's internal apprenticeship scheme retention rate is much higher, sitting at 96%. And of uh, those uh, who have completed their apprenticeships, uh, Ealing Council's progressions into employment, education and training sit at 95%. Um, now, the success is due to a range of support measures that work uh, that we have in place. Uh, we have an apprenticeship team who support managers to set up, recruit, monitor and manage their apprentices internally. We have built strong relationships with the training providers. We also have internal pastoral support for apprentices and we also have support from the top of the organisation to encourage retention through the priority recruitment policy. So after redeployees, any roles that are at uh, grade six and below must be advertised to apprentices first. And where apprentices are successful in securing these positions, but have not completed their apprenticeship studies, managers are, are, are encouraged to support them into to completion of their apprenticeship. And now after 15 years of running the, the scheme, there have been enough people, including myself, who have gone through the scheme that are still working at the council uh, with some in management positions and recruiting their own apprentices to their teams. Uh, there are also apprentices who have gone through the apprenticeship scheme and are now undertaking degree apprenticeships in areas such as planning and surveying. Uh, now, the apprenticeships are available at different levels, ranging from level two through to level seven, and they are now called apprenticeship standards. Now, a level two is equ equivalent of five GCSEs. Level three is equivalent of two A-levels. Level four is equivalent to foundation degree. Level five and six are equivalent to uh, a degree, and level seven is equivalent to postgraduate. Now, the pandemic ha had an impact on, uh, on apprenticeships and also changed the working practices. So a combination of the uncertainty and uh, that the COVID crisis would bring along with the need to work from home led to managers not being able to offer apprenticeship roles. And we have seen uh, nationally the numbers of apprenticeships declined uh, by 70% as a result of the pandemic. And as part of the government's plan for good jobs, uh, Ealing participated in the Kickstart scheme last year and the council 
to employ 30 young people as part of the programme, along with the easing of COVID restrictions and getting used to work from, working, working from home, the Kickstart scheme helped managers to gain confidence in supporting young people who had less work experience. And as a result, we have seen four people starting apprenticeships and eight people moving into jobs at the council. And a total uh, um, 20, of 26 Kickstarters moving into employment, education or training. Uh, now, this financial year, um, there has been a marked increase in the number of apprenticeships at the council. And we are on track to have 15 people recruited by the end of the financial year as per our plan. Uh, now, looking at the Ealing Training Allowance model, the National Apprentice Minimum Wage is currently sitting at £4.81 per hour. The council has always paid above that uh, minimum and has a model that rises incrementally over the course of the apprenticeship as the person gains skills and experience. And the current training allowance model for apprentices at Ealing Council is the table that you'll see in, on the screen. So at level two, the, the start rate is £6 per hour, which raises to £9 per hour which is national minimum wage uh, at uh, month seven and the total annual, annual training allowance for a level two apprentice is 14,105. Now at level three and level four as you can see um, at the moment with the recent increase in real living wage being the same as London living wage apprentices are starting at 11, nine, 11 pounds 95 per hour so real living wage which then goes on to the London living wage which at the moment it's the same uh, they're both uh, they're both the same so the total annual training allowance for both level three and level four is 21,749 pounds. Now we are currently um, drafting a proposal to review the training allowance model which will be submitted to our senior leadership team in the new year to review this training allowance for apprentices at Ealing Council. Uh, now, the apprenticeship scheme has been an excellent way for the organisation to work towards addressing the imbalance in the workforce in terms of age. The majority, as I mentioned in previous slides, of apprentices aged between 60 and 24 had started, as well as creating roles uh, with training that led to positive progressions for the majority of the participants. In addition, this year, uh, we have a pre-apprenticeship programme uh, that is being run as part of, a, of our council commitment to care leavers. Uh, the Our Horizons Pathways programme will support uh, four co cohorts of 15 care leavers on a five month program that includes two days paid work placements within the council plus one day employment support mentoring and progression support and trainees are paid up to 15 hours per week at national minimum wage previous programs that we run have achieved a 75 percent progression rate into education employment and training outcomes and with the introduction of the apprenticeship levy in 2017 when the, where, when the eligibility changed for apprenticeships um, so that people of all ages and qualification levels could potentially uh, have undertake an apprenticeship. We have created um, our own corporate programme within the council and since the introduction of the programme 140 staff have, have started apprenticeships as part of a staff training programme. Um, this has also been a route for the council to train uh, social workers with eight uh, staff members undertaking social work apprenticeship degrees. Um, now, the council also made a commitment to local employers or those with a strong link to the borough with a levy transfer scheme for businesses. So this utilises unspent apprenticeship levy from the council to pay for apprenticeship training for employers. There is a council commitment that we have to gift uh, up to 400,000 of levy. Um, over four years to employers and so far uh, we have uh, gifted £66,000 for, apprentice for apprenticeships including teacher, sports coach, horticulture and early years practitioners. Uh, we've also just created the Ealing Apprenticeship Partnership uh, which is a group of apprenticeship training providers and the council to develop an apprenticeship offer that will support residents into good careers and help businesses develop a highly skilled workforce and this will also drive the number of apprenticeship vacancies in the borough and hope Hopefully support our our target of creating 2,000 apprenticeships in Ealing. Thank you so much. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, um, just like to say at this point um, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, Councillor Sid, who uh, messaged me to say that she's currently working on the HS2 project, so that's an additional uh, declaration to add to the declarations earlier on. Um, so now I'd yes, I'd like to very much welcome. Uh, Ambrose Koshi, who's from uh, HS2, Limited Skills Manager of HS2 Limited, uh, to present the next uh, section for us. Well, thank you very much, Chair. Um, by way of introduction, um, so my role is twofold, really, for HS2 Limited. 
that, that microphone is making a funny noise, isn't it? Wanna try, if you want to try the next one, I think some of them are a bit faulty. Yeah, sorry about that. Is that better? That's much better. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so my role is twofold at HS2 Limited. Firstly, it's around overseeing um, the contractual requirements that um, our tier one contractors in London have principally um, SCS Railways, our main work civils contractor, um, Balfour, BT, Vinci, Sistra, our station construction partner for Old Oak Common, and Maestro Gardos, um, our station construction partner for Euston. Um, and in the second area of my responsibilities around overseeing some of our key stakeholder relationships, including with Ealing Council. Um, and at this stage, I'd like to convey my thanks um, for all the work that the council officers do to support me and my colleagues, um, Angela, Naz, and the wider team, um, because it's very important for us um, that we work to connect Ealing residents, the opportunities that we've got, given the bus proximity to the HS2 line of route. Next slide, please. Okay, so across the whole HS2 programme, we've got seven strategic goals, uh, one of which, which you can see um, in the bottom of this slide is skills and employment. Um, this for us is very important because the work we do in this space is an integral part of delivering the whole programme. It's not a nice to have, it's not just about corporate social responsibility, it's a core part of the work that we do. And part of the reason for that is that we've got very significant workforce requirements. Um, so we published our updated labour and skills forecasting data last year, which shows that at the peak construction period of HS2, in terms of building the railway line, we're going to need about 34,000 people um, from London through to Manchester and Leeds. And our peak workforce requirement in London is around 9,000. So if we don't find enough people to help us deliver um, the programme, that sets out a significant program um, risk. But we want to do um, as part of this is leave behind a sustainable legacy to really demonstrate the benefits of HS2. So being able to open up our opportunities to people from local communities and disadvantaged and underrepresented groups is a really core cool part um, of the work that we do. Next slide, please. So proceeding our updated labour and skills forecasting data, we published the skills, employment and education strategy um, in 2018, and that's got four key priority areas. Um, the first around making sure that we've got um, the right skilled workforce to deliver the whole programme, but to do it in a way that leaves behind a sustainable skills legacy that benefits not just HS2, but the wider transport infrastructure sector and UK economy. And in the second areas around our supply chain, um, it's the company I work for, HS2 Limited, we're going to employ a small number of people relative to our supply chain. And therefore, as the client, it's important that we use our contractual leverage to get our supply chain to deliver the things that we think are important, including within this space. So um, what we require of our supply chain is to deliver activities such as employing previously workless individuals, creating work placements, a pathway into paid employment, recruiting apprentices, working with schools and FE colleges, and also doing work to upskill the existing workforce. And basically one of these activities needs to be delivered per three million pounds of contract value. So when you think about contracts that run to billions of pounds, that's a lot of activities that our supply chain needs to deliver. We want to make sure they deliver all those activities in the right way, which is the key part of my role um, to ensure that. In the third area is around um, working with schools and young people. We do not just work with young people in schools, but we feel it's an important group of people to prioritise. Um, so we do things such as delivering um, STEM workshops um, across schools local to the HS2 line of route. Schools will also ask us to deliver certain interventions such as um, attending careers fairs or delivering um, employability support, for example, mock interviews. We also attend large scale events such as Skills London recently um, at London Excel um, last month. And the fourth area is around um, working in partnership, a, re a real recognition that we can't do all of this on our own. If we want to see certain groups of people better represented across our workforce, we haven't got all the answers or indeed expertise when it comes to engaging with those people, creating the right pathways into employment and ensuring those people, once they're in employment, can sustain that employment and progress um, in the workplace. Next slide, please. And just to take on the partnership point um, further, um, 
So last year we launched something called the HS2 job brokerage model. So this is what we are doing um, to really create pathways into employment for people from local communities and diverse groups, but to do that at scale. And the job brokerage model's got two key components to it. The first is the jobs board that sits on the HS2 website. So that brings together vacancies from across our supply chain to give people, whether they are stakeholders or job seekers, greater visibility of roles that are available across the program. And then the second component is a network of job brokerage partners, organizations that have got the requisite expertise to be able to help us to create those pathways into employment for those people that we want to see better represented um, across our workforce. Um, in London, um, our network of job brokerage partners and many local authorities, including Ealing Council, so we work very closely with the team um, to create those pathways into our roles um, for, for local people. Next slide, please. And this is a summary of some of the interventions that we've been delivering um, in Ealing. Um, so if I start from the top left and then move across. Um, so I mentioned earlier about the fact that we deliver STEM workshops um, in local schools. We've got a program um, that does prioritise um, Ealing schools working very closely with Maria Wright um, to make sure that local schools get access to those STEM workshops. For example, Greenford High School um, is an example of a local school that's benefited from those um, STEM workshops. Um, we've also got a big priority around young people with SCND. Um, so earlier this year, we delivered a project with the Ealing Send Hub um, that supported 11 students from Bellevue College. Um, so it's an eight week intervention in total, which included us going to the college to deliver um, employability supports to young people. And they also went to our youth and old oak common sites to get an insight into the works we're doing across those two parts of the program and also greater insights into the opportunities that we've also got across the program. I think it's fair to say from my point of view, and this view will be shared by my colleagues who are involved in this particular program, that is one of the best things we've done in a very long time. Um, in the skills and employment space. It was absolutely fantastic to the point we're already planning another um, project with the Ealing Centre Hub to start early next year. So it's been a really, really good thing for us to be involved in. Then the next thing is around our tunnelling works. Um, so we are digging 26 miles of tunnels in London from West Ryslip through to um, Camden. Um, and for that, we're going to be using seven tunnel boring machines. Um, and it's a particular tradition around tunnel boring machines, which is that they all need to be given female names after St. Barbara, the patron saint of underground workers. Um, and we've launched the first two tunnel boring machines um, in London. Um, and we conduct the school's competition um, to name these first two tunnel boring machines. Um, so what you can see um, in the top right hand corner is Sashila Harani. So Shashila, Shashila, sorry, Sashila is the name of our first tunnel boy machine. And Sashila is a uh, teacher at Greenford High School. And she um, was selected um, by two, one of the local schools um, as the name of the first TBM that's been launched um, in London. It was actually two Ealing schools that named um, those TBMs, um, Derry Meadow and Brentside Primary Academy. And there she saluted uh, Shilla, sorry, with our chief executive, um, Mark Thurston. Um, also linked to this, we're currently delivering a pre-employment a pre uh, pre program linked to our tunneling works, um, where we've had people going through training that's been delivered by um, West London College. We've also got lots of support from local partners such as Ealing Council. And we've currently got 11 people doing work placements currently, three of whom are Ealing residents. Um, the end goal for this program is to get people into apprenticeships and non-apprenticeship roles. And early next year, we'll have some outcomes to, to share in terms of how those people have got on. Then bottom left-hand corner is the work we're doing with the OPDC and principally the Forge at Park Royal. I know Billy's speaking after me, so I won't steal his thunder. Um, but in summary, um, the OPDC secured £255,000 of HS2 community funds um, to deliver the Forge at Park Royal. So we work very closely with Billy and his team around connecting local people to the opportunities um, that we've got across the programme in London. And engagement is very important for us in terms of how do we reach the right people um, that we want to see better represented across our workforce. Um, so last week we were at your Winter Jobs Fair, um, particularly uh, my colleagues from Balfour, Beatty, Vinci, Sistra on the Old Oak Common um, Station project. 
And then finally, um, the picture you can see in the bottom right um, is a young lady called Julia, an Ealing resident, doing a civil engineering apprenticeship with SCS Railways, our main work civils um, contractor. Next slide, please, which I believe is my last one. So this is, oh, it's not showing that great, actually. Um, but this is um, just to give you a sense of um, what all of this is leading to in terms of Ealing residents accessing our opportunities. Um, there are two key metrics that, that we use to demonstrate how local people benefit from our, from our opportunities. The first is something that we call workless job starts. These are individuals um, who secure employment across the program for at least 26 weeks. And the second is apprenticeship starts. So these are individuals who start an apprenticeship where that lasts for at least 12 weeks. So in terms of workless job starts um, across the whole program, when it comes to Ealing residents, we've had 96 workless job starts coming from Ealing residents um, from February 2017 to September 2022. Um, and that is, I think, from memory, because I can't see the percentage there, around 11% of the Greater London um, total. Um, and then we've got apprenticeship starts, um, so 24 in Ealing, which is 9% of the Greater London um, total. Now, if those numbers were equal, equally spread across London, you'd be seeing more, more like 3% of, say, apprenticeship starts um, coming from Ealing. So what we're seeing is that the focus work we are doing in your borough is leading to that disproportionality in terms of your residents benefiting from the opportunities that we've got. And just one final point in apprenticeships. Um, so we've made a commitment um, to the borough around local people's access to apprenticeships. Um, so I've agreed a target with Angela and Naz um, to ensure that at least 7% of all the Greater London apprenticeship starts across the HS2 programme come from Ealing residents. And you can see from the slide there that currently we're over and above that target. And we want to make sure that it stays at at least um, that level moving forward. And I think that's it from me. Great. Uh, so thank you very much, Ambrose. Um, as I said, we're going to take the questions yeah. at the end. And um, so the final final part is um, on uh, the Forge at Park Royal, Old Oak and Park Royal Development. Uh, and we have uh, William Sago, who's the manager at the Forge at Park Royal, uh, who'll be presenting this section. Hello. Um, good evening, Chair. Good evening, members. Good evening, colleagues. It's very nice to be back at Ealing. I used to work here a long time ago working with Vanita and with uh, currently I work with Naz and Andrew as well so and and Diana was actually my apprentice so it's nice to see Diana developing <laughs> and growing so it's great can I have the first slide please Diana thank you as mentioned I manage the forge at Park Royal and just to give you some context and, and background uh, we're part of the um, o OPDC which is the Old Oak and Park Royal Development Corporation um, it was launched in August 2020, and as Ambrose mentioned, we are funded by the HS2 Business and Local Economy Fund, £255,000 and £200, and we have OPDC um, match with that as well. So we are essentially a delivery partnership with the boroughs of Brent, Ealing, Hammersmith and Fulham, the Shore Trust, DWP, that's the Department of Work and Pensions, and West London College. Um, we have a constituted delivery board. Naz sits on that board. She uh, took over from Angela recently and we meet quarterly. We work really closely, as Ambrose has indicated, with HS2 with the joint ventures of BBVS, SES Railways, Align and Mace Dragados. And when I say closely, our first outcome actually um, in around about October 2020 was an Ealing resident who we put into a paid work placement at uh, the Old Oak Common site in the HR department. She went on to do a level five apprenticeship and is now working full time in the HR department, BBVS. So that's a real success story for us. That was our first outcome bit for an Ealing resident. Um, we currently have, I have a team of three recruitment and business advisors. Each one of those has responsibility for one of the boroughs I've mentioned, Brent, Ealing, Hamilton and Fulham. And I also have one apprentice who we are just about to interview. Hopefully he'll become a full-time um, project support officer with me. We um, also have uh, agreed, the boroughs have kindly agreed to provide some match funding to fund those posts to June 24. Um, so the grant agreements are being signed off um, as, as I speak, I hope. Um, essentially our remit is to provide support to businesses in Park Royal, uh, Brent, Ealing and Hammersmith and Fulham 
and also to uncover vacancies, post those on our portal and across the net our, our networks in each borough and in each of our partners and to promote those vacancies and work with residents and job brokerages within each borough and Shore Trust and DWP to get residents into those jobs get, and get them ready to compete for those jobs. So for example, we work very closely with Work Ealing. Uh, so we share vacancies. We have fortnightly meetings, a wider team meeting with each of the boroughs. Previously, when the project was first set up, when it was just me setting everything up, uh, the boroughs kindly uh, agreed to loan me a member of their job brokerage team. Now that model um, didn't really work that effectively due to time pressures and workload. So hence we've recruited three full-time staff, as I've mentioned, which the boroughs are providing some match funding towards the, the staffing costs. So uh, when we deliver outreach and events to in job centres in the community, so we're active in uh, West Ealing, the Ealing Reap Job Centre and Acton Job Centre. We go in there, uh, my colleague goes in there to promote our vacancies. We very, have worked very closely with the partnership manager in each of the boroughs as well. And next slide, uh, slide please, Diana. Thank you. This is just a brief map, not very clear, unfortunately, of Park Royal, in case you're not familiar. Park Royal is London's largest trading estate, industrial estate. Um, we have a huge variety of, of occupational sectors there, uh, ranging from um, um, food manufacture, transport, logistics, informa information and communications, um, public services, retail, restaurants and warehousing. Next, uh, next slide, please, Diana. Thank you. Uh, Park Royal is home to 1,700 businesses. Most of those are SMEs, small to medium enterprises, employing 500 people or less. Uh, and actually of those, the majority are micro businesses employing less than 10 people. On total in the estate, um, around about 40,000 people are employed and about 4,000 people live in Park Royal. It's quite a strange mix of housing and commercial premises there. Um, so Park Royal crosses the three boroughs of Ealing, Brent and Hammersmith and Fulham in those proportions you can see on the screen. Actually, OPDC, we are the planning authority and regeneration authority um, agency rather for the area of <coughs> Old Oak Common. Now, most of that actually lies in Hammersmith and Fulham, but obviously we work across the three boroughs as well, um, as well as part rural uh, the estate. Approximately 800 of those 1700 businesses are in Ealing. Uh, and we're actually um, we're actually commissioning some data to actually get a more accurate picture of that as well. So and the major factor, major sectors, rather, as I've mentioned, are food and drink manufacturer, warehousing, logistics, wholesale, garage and motor repair. And as Fia's mentioned, uh, Park Royal, uh, we are in a partnership with Ealing Council for the Acton Creative Enterprise Zone because Park Royal hosts 250 creative businesses ranging from film studios to makeup provision to supply chain, the whole gamut of businesses there to makers, fabricators. And there are some fantastic array of businesses there. And in fact, I was in a meeting with Fee last week in a moderation meeting for the Creative Enterprise Zone bids. And they'll, they'll be announced very shortly who the successful businesses were to access some money. Next slide, please, Diana. Thank you. So this is just an overview of what we've achieved to date since August 2020. We've engaged with 234 employers. Most of those are in part raw, but by no means all of them. We have 124 uh, employers that have used the service. So we might have gone to see and uh, um, visit a business, but not necessarily to use them. So that they are registered with us. We have 424 vacancies advertised with those businesses. And we have filled to date 164 um, people. Um, number of those candidates in employment staff after six months is 87, with 755 residents um, registered with us on our portal. And we currently have 27 vacancies. That's actually up to 30 now as of today. Next slide, please, Diana. And some Ealing outcomes. We have 90 Ealing employers engaged. Um, or kind of registered with us, that, that should be actually. 36 using the service. We have 87 Ealing vacancies advertised. 71 of our 165 vacancies is, have been filled by Ealing residents. Uh, 35 of those are still in employment after six months. Obviously that changes every week as we track start dates. 
and number of Ealing residents registered 307 and we have 11 Ealing vacancies live at the moment and most of those are in the food and manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions. Oh, beg your pardon. Oh, that is my last slide. <laughs> so this is some future plans. Um, we will organise with Ealing Council a creative enterprise um, careers fair to go with the enterprise zone. Hopefully that will be held at um, the Ealing project. We visited the project last month. Very, very good premises. So I'm hoping to do that and we'll, we'll fund that, that um, fair. We'll work with HS2 and BBVS on the Old Oak Common site, um, a construction careers fair. In that will include um, construction employers and tier one contractors from across the three boroughs. Probably, probably hold that one in the drum at um, Brent Civic Centre. We will commission a new programme business support to part rural SMEs. Previously, we did commission support from Branduin to work with um, part rural SMEs to do a business support across a variety of topics. They help theme webinars. This was obviously the height of the pandemic. We're going to commission another round of business support that's going to be slightly different. What we are, we're going through procurement now with TFL, who is our procurement partner, to commission a panel of experts who, when we go and see a business, the business might say to us, for example, I need support with a, a leasing issue or I need some HR support. We can then refer that business to a specialist who can provide up to three, four hours of support and we will fund that activity. We will also commission an employment support program for 15 GAM members across the three boroughs. This is really, uh, this, this will be delivered by the Change Foundation Street Elite program, which we work with very closely in Ealing when I worked here. And I commissioned it again in Hammersmith and Fulham when I worked there. So we're going through procurement for that. Uh, and that's quite an exciting development actually. And I hope to link those up um, employment projects, um, outcomes rather with HS2. Uh, the BBVS site. Currently, uh, Bartley Group provide um, work opportunities for people completing the program. Uh, so I hope to include HS2 in, in, in that process. We will also refer part rural businesses to the GLA Better Futures program, which is a program that um, can support companies who deliver clean tech um, um, delivery. And also some, we have a solar panel project where we can talk to a business who might want solar panels installing, um, installing rather, and refer them into specialists who can um, advise them how that happens. And that's something that OPD is, OPDC is funding. And really finally, we will continue our mainstream recruitment and outreach delivery. We'll, we'll carry on doing what we're doing at the moment and hopefully develop that as well. So thank you, that's my final slide. Great. Uh, thanks very much, William. Uh, so now um, we move to questions. Um, so if I can see indications from uh, people present in the, the room, members of the panel in the room and online, if you've got questions for any of the presentations, I'll, while you're thinking about them, I'll start with a couple. Um, oh, actually, no, sorry, you go ahead. Start, okay, I'll ask one and then I'll go to, go to you. Yeah. Um, so for, first one um, for, for Ambrose, I was wondering in terms of the um, the, the kind of high volume um, jobs during the construction phase, uh, to what extent do they need kind of specialist civil engineering skills and to what extent is it transferable from, from construction and so on? Um, thank you, Chair. I think the really interesting thing about a program of our scale is that, yes, you've got a lot of like construction trade based roles. You've got a lot of engineering type roles as well. We've got such a wide array of opportunities, um, including within our offices. So um, a lot of the things we do around engagement is to really um, give people insights into that broad range of opportunities that we've got opportunities that they wouldn't necessarily connect to a program um, of our nature. So to give you um, a couple of examples, um, we've got cybersecurity apprentices. We've also got fraud investigation apprentices um, on the program. You wouldn't necessarily think that you'd need that type of um, specialisms um, in terms of what we are, what we are delivering. Um, but um, in terms of the scale of opportunities, yes, given where we are in terms of the phasing of the program, it will be a lot that's construction engineering related. And we can open up various types of pathways to help people um, into those opportunities. So apprenticeships, yes. 
Um, we also do work with universities as well to engage with um, postgraduates. For example, we've done some work with University of East London, not in your patch I accept, but to give you an example, we've got some civil engineering postgraduates did some work placements of us, and most of those have now moved into um, permanent paid employment um, on the programme. And, and in terms of um, West London College, you said you've been doing some, some work with, is, yep. there, is there scope for more specific training from West London College to, to provide roles that you particularly need? Yeah, so absolutely. We've been um, involved with West London College for a number of years now, um, including when it comes to Mayor's Construction Academy, the West London hub that was um, coordinated by West London College. We're also supporting the Green Skills Hub um, that they're coordinating now as well. Um, and also talking to them about the plans they've got for Southall Community College, where I mentioned the tunneling um, pre-employment programme earlier. Um, it's from that site the pre-employment training um, was delivered. Um, so, yes, we're very keen to kind of continue that relationship and strengthen it where we can. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, so Councillor Nandi, you have a question. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, everyone, for your presentations. It's very useful. Um, I have a question for William. Um, your third last slide actually showed um, vacancies advertised to fulfillments. Um, there appeared to be um, a 30% fulfillment rate there. Um, is there anything that we can do within ourselves in the council to help increase that fulfillment rate there on the vacancies. And uh, my second point is about the solar panels. If we could understand a little bit more about the solar panels. I've had a business in Park Row for many years, a food and drink business. I know Park Row quite well, actually very well. And um, the issue that we have there is that there might be just one landowner or one building owner, but there are many, many micro businesses. So how would the micro businesses benefit from the funding that you may be giving to the solar panels? Will there be some kind of sharing between what you give to the landowner as opposed to the businesses? Thank you. And, and um, William, I see you had your hand up as well. Were, were you wanting to add something to the uh, other answer as well? Yes, I was, Chair. Thank you. I'll, I'll, come, up, I'll come to your question in a minute, Councillor. Thank you. Yes, um, really, to just, just to add to what Ambrose was saying, um, I mentioned that our first outcome was um, a young woman who started a paid, paid placement with BBBS who were building the old conversation. Those paid placements were a fantastic opportunity to actually learn more about the whole civil engineering industry. And then you can decide really from that which area might interest you, whether it would be cybersecurity, whether it would be HR or another discipline within, within civil engineering. That's really what I wanted to add to what Ambrose was saying. But councillor, if I can come back to your uh, last part of your question, it's something that is, it's, it's an issue in Park Royal where you have a business who might want solar panelling, but of course is um, in, a, in a building owned by a landlord or, or maybe shared with other tenants in that building. Uh, we're talking to Seagra about this as well, who are one of the major landowners in, in, in Park Royal. What I can do, I can't answer your question now, but I will get back to you with that, I promise, because my, my colleague Alex, unfortunately, couldn't be on the call today from technical difficulties. He is more knowledgeable about that project. But certainly I know from, from, from talking to some of the businesses in that situation, where you have, for example, a building with an asbestos roof, that would not be suitable for a solar panel. But a lot of businesses want to install solar panels because obviously with the energy crisis we're experiencing now, it's a fantastic way to reduce your energy bills, especially for high volume um, consumers like the, uh, the food industry, for example. Mm -hmm. I will get back to you, councillor, with my car. I will ask Alex Marsh to get back to you to answer that question, if that's okay with you. And you're- That's fine, thank you. Thank you. And um, the first part of your question, um, we are working closely with, with Work Healing uh, to see what we can do to get more healing residents into the vacancies we advertise. We are experiencing, um, quite low quality CVs coming through from DWP. It's a question, it's something that we, we're tackling. We do refer people into um, the National Career Service for support. And we and my, my team do work with individuals to try and develop CVs. However, we can talk to employers. What we do, we screen and match on behalf of the employer. That's, that's something we undertake to do. We will only send the CV through or an application form through that we think matches or nearly matches the employer's person spec or, um, or job spec with experience. 
So um, to answer your question, there is more we can do. We can work more closely with Work Healing to try and um, get more information about the vacancies, to make sure people fully understand what the role involves, and also to work with them to actually prepare them better for those vacancies. And that's the background work that the job brokerages in Brent, Ealing, Hammersmith and Fulham carry out on our behalf. We can do some of that work. But to answer your question, yes, there is more we can do. And I'll be raising this at the next uh, delivery board meeting with NAS. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've got a, a question for Fiona. Um, so you mentioned uh, hospitality, retail and tourism. And I just wanted to, to look at the third part of that, the tourism, um, because we have there are a lot of um, points of interest about, about Ealing Borough, not least the Ealing Studios Film Heritage. Uh, and we have a lot of, of hotel uh, places now in Ealing, but it tends to be that people staying in the hotels are just using it as a convenient place halfway between the airport and the uh, and, and, and central London. So uh, is, is any work being done to try to um, encourage encourage tourism? Because clearly yeah. it can, can generate a lot of jobs. Yeah, in, indeed. Um, part of this um, uh, particular subject links very much with the cultural manifesto work uh, and the action plan we're developing with the arts and cultures team, uh, with uh, uh, Jan and his team, um, particularly picking up on the fact that um, there's some amazing history, social history and other characteristics of Ealing that we're, we're not really promoting uh, and is not widely known outside the borough. Uh, and that includes both the music heritage, film heritage um, and uh, other characteristics. Um, so part of what we're looking at is how we can put in place the infrastructure to support uh, the tourism offer. So we have interpretation, but also ways in which people can find out about um, the history and culture of, of Ealing and better promote that. So rather than just be, as you rightly said, uh, Ealing has great proximity into London and out to motorways and the airport and has an abundance of hotel uh, div um, with different star ratings where people can stay. There's lots of reasons that um, people could come to Ealing to enjoy uh, the, the environment here, but we need to create the infrastructure to enable that uh, and support that to happen. Um, something that's widely known is Ealing as a green place with um, uh, navigable and walkable canal pathways. But what's lesser known is other aspects of heritage and the amazing range of filming that goes on in Ealing, including The Crown and other series that people will be aware of, but they won't necessarily connect it with our borough. So as part of the delivery plan for UK Shared Prosperity, we're looking at a range of public realm initiatives um, that support the place promotion and celebrate and showcase all these different aspects that to date we've underplayed, but they can add to the overall cultural offer and add to the um, the, the range of arts and culture infrastructure that, that, that we have in the borough. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so uh, Councillor Martin. Um, I'd also add to that that we've also got a Premiership football team sitting um, just the over the border in Hounslow. And I think it's important just for our local businesses that any visitors to the West London area visit Ealing rather than visit sort of Hounslow, Richmond, Chiswick. So it's giving that offering so that our high street businesses survive because it just ups their footfall. So that is certainly something that uh, that we're going to consider to look at as well. Great, thank you. Uh, can I just ask uh, another question to Ambrose um, on the, um, the, 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 the timing in terms of, um, do, do you have any kind of um, rough uh, feelings of, of um, when when the peak of construction jobs in this part of the um of hs2 will will be and and kind of um how how quickly jobs will build up coming up to that yeah sure so um in terms of the 34000 jobs which is the program wide figure um we peak at around 2027 28 um in terms of phase 1 which is london to birmingham 
um, we're going to be peaking around now, particularly when you think about our tunneling works um, that have started, um, then the ramping up of work across um, the two stations, Euston and Old Oak Common. Um, so now is the time really when you're going to see that real um, availability of opportunities. A lot of the work we've been doing over the past two to three years with, with colleagues at the council has been really preparing for this moment. Um, and so that tunneling pre-employment programme that I mentioned earlier is the real kind of start of being able to demonstrate at scale that we can connect local people to the opportunities that we've got. Have we got have we got any more questions? Anyone? Uh Councillor Martin? It's not it's not a question really, but it's um just to sort of throw it out there really to all the job sort of area. Um over the last um week I've discovered that there potentially is a business about to make 220 people redundant on my ward. And I think it's quite important now that we start those conversations to possibly look at doing some retraining um, and at least start those discussions to see potentially if there are other jobs out there. So um, it'd be really good to link up with everyone outside of this meeting to uh, make sure that uh, contacts are made. Yes, I mean, that's that's certainly that's certainly a good point. Yes, um, can I just ask a general question? Um, so, thank you to the members who came along to the site visit um, that we that we did at the uh, at the jobs fair. Uh, and one of the things that um, arose from that were that there were a number of um, organisations there that had open apprenticeships that were struggling to find people to to take them. Uh, Remember, there was a construction company that needed dry liners, and they were they were found it impossible to to find them. Um, just really, really sort of asking uh, any of the panel who want to come in on that in, in terms of what 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 can be done to try to um, promote promote apprenticeships, and how much how how often is that a problem that there are there are there's, there's funding for apprenticeships, but nobody wants to to do those particular roles. I can come in there, Chair, if you don't mind. I'm sure Ambrose would like to contribute as well. But our experience is we are finding it very difficult to attract people to the apprenticeships, especially the ones we promote from HS2 are very well paid. Certainly London Indian Wage or thereabouts as well. Um, I think what's happening is Brexit ex exacerbated an already um, severe skill shortage in the construction industry. I think people um, aren't attracted to construction. There's a lot of there's a lot of rebranding to do around apprenticeships. I think as well. I also think the levy has a lot to do with it. I think what some employers are using the levy to retrain existing staff to create apprenticeships from existing staff. Not all by any means. And I think a lot of young people, particularly, can't see the point of doing an apprenticeship when they can go straight into a job. They can't be bothered with going to college, and they can't be bothered with the whole you know, uncertainty of an apprenticeship, whereas that they, they'd much rather go into paid employment straight away. That's that's our finding, certainly. Yes, I see. And Ambrose, you wanted to add to that? We have a lot of that, um, but to add a few things, um, I think there is, well, it's a multifaceted um, issue. So firstly, there is a perception issue, as, as Billy's alluded to, both in relation to apprenticeships and the construction industry. Um, so lots of people um, don't think that construction is particularly attractive, and that can include because they're not aware of, as I mentioned earlier, the broad range of opportunities that are available, but also the nature of construction sites. One of the things that people sometimes say to us when they come into our construction sites is, I can't believe how clean it is. I can't believe how safe it is. Um, so it's those types of things that people have in their minds about, you know, what a construction site um, might be about. With apprenticeships, I think there's still an issue around the attractiveness um, of those opportunities, both in relation to young people and also their parents, carers and influencers. Um, I've had numerous conversations with parents who still feel that actually the only route for their for their child or children is to go to university without actually acknowledging the wider range of opportunities that could take that young person or young people to the same destination. Um, because ultimately, and it's not a right or wrong answer, 
with an apprenticeship, you can now go up to level seven, you know, which is a master's degree. The employer who's employing the person will be covering the cost of the training. So you're not getting into debt. So these are the types of things that we try to do when it comes to engaging with young people around giving them enough information to make an informed choice about the best option um, that will be uh, um, available to them. Um, but then um, I think we also need to recognize the fact in terms of the struggles when it comes to recruitment, it's a challenge that we are facing and we're not alone. I think a lot of companies across multiple sectors are struggling to recruit right now. Um, I think part of it is down to Brexit in so far as when it comes to London, um, there's been a historic dependence on EU migrant labor. And now it's more difficult um, to get that migrant labor um, into the UK um, and London. Um, but I also think when you look at, for example, the impact of COVID-19, rising levels of economic inactivity, that is also having an impact on our ability to, to attract um, people. Um, I'd also like to pick up on something that Billy mentioned earlier around um, like the quality of applications that are coming through, because that's something that we are, we are experiencing. It's an across the board issue rather than focusing on, on any one um, organization. But we do find at times that um, people can can apply for roles at HS2 without a real understanding of the role they're applying for, um, poor quality applications. Um, if they do get shortlisted, they might not turn up for an interview and not inform the recruiting manager that they can't attend that interview, which does have an impact because in terms of me and my immediate colleagues, we're very committed to creating those pathways. But the reality for us is that we've got a very complex supply chain, so tier two, tier three, tier four suppliers who can sometimes be reluctant to engage in the types of activities that we think are important. So when you do get them to engage, it's really important that we can demonstrate that they can find good quality candidates from these types of interventions, because if not, despite the contractual leverage that we've got, we want them to deliver in a goodwill way. And if we can't demonstrate that these types of interventions work, it does make it difficult to get to get that goodwill. So those would be my thoughts um, in terms of these challenges. Great. Thanks very much. Um, so, uh, Fiona, uh, put your hand up and then put it down again. Were you going to say something and it got said by someone oh, else or did you want to add something? Sorry, the Internet um, got interrupted. I was just typing it into the chat uh, just to share quickly that um, businesses that took part in our built environment sector forum shared those same concerns. So I certainly mirror what um, Billy and Ambrose uh, shared about some of the challenges, particularly around how, how parents can influence young people's uh, choices and career decisions and how we need to raise awareness, not just among young people and teachers, but also their family as well, to just make sure that people are fully aware of uh, the good job opportunities that um, construction as part of the built environment uh, can offer. Uh, thank you. And um, well, I've got um, uh, Praveen wants to add something and then William. Yeah. I think it was briefly just added there. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, when you do the engagement um, with the uh, young adults coming on to deciding whether they want to go into degree or whatever, that starts at an early age. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very pointless to speak to somebody who's just about finishing or just going into their last stage of A-levels, leaving school, saying, oh, you can do apprentice because you go through that training phase and you're geared up. So just wanted to understand what year, at what stage do you actually speak to them? And I think it's really important because from the days that I graduated, it was always that you graduate uh, as opposed to doing a practical course because you are a professional or whatever you may be. So, I mean, I think what the education thing that we need to also perhaps uh, engage with is not just the young adults, but also their parents, as already said, because once they understand that the, there's so many benefits that you're not going to have debt, you're not going to have choices of whether one child goes to university or two go to university, there are options. I think that would be quite good. So just to understand at what stage do you actually engage with Parents and uh, do you engage with parents and at what stage do you engage with the young adults? Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, now I've got uh, William and then uh, Nassim afterwards. Yes, really just to say that's a very, a very that's a very good question, Councillor. Um, I know that HS2 uh, go into schools and they go into uh, secondary schools. I think that's a really good case for going into primary schools. Certainly OPDC, we are the planning authority for that part of London. And it's a 30 year project. So very somebody in infant school now 
could well be working on and living in those de those developments as they come on in 30 years time. And HS2, uh, the station's being built, they're ready in about six, seven years time. So there's fantastic opportunities. I, th I think Ambrose has made some very good points as well about sort of rebadging construction as it were. There's a lot of myth busting around construction. And I think apprenticeships are a fantastic opportunity for young people. So that, that's the work, that, that's the challenge that, that we, we, we um, have to, uh, have to, and that we have to crack. And at the next delivery board meeting, I'll be uh, devoting the whole meeting really to seeing what we can do to increase levels of uh, apprenticeship and getting people into those roles, because it's something that we're all facing, whether you're in Ealing, Brent, Hamilton, Fulham, HS2, or a business in Ealing. I'm going to present to the um, acting bid on the 27th of January, and I'll be talking about apprenticeships of that as well. So I'll keep people posted. Okay, thanks. Uh, can I hear from uh, Nassim and then uh, back to Ambrose? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to answer your question, um, Councillor Anand, uh, something that we will be doing with uh, work healing at Vinita's obviously in the core, which has got connection problems at the moment, is that we are looking at a new approach um, of going into the schools sooner than later now to, to promote apprenticeships to school leavers that are now coming to the end of the year before they make the decision as to where they want to go. And again, picking that point, we've identified a gap there in the delivery and the way we're promoting that. But also, as what Ambrose and Billy uh, have suggested as well, some of the apprenticeship sectors, especially construction and others, will probably need rebranding and we'll be working in partnership with providers that will be able to do that with us. So it's things that we've been identifying this year, especially as we've come in at the pandemic mm -hmm. and we're beginning to engage more face to face delivery. One of the reports from probably our scrutiny one where we presented back our findings on a report that we commissioned uh, to see why the fall of apprenticeships dropped as well. Identity, you know, we're, we're looking at that and looking at the gaps to see if we can close that gap and promote and get more people engaged because it's a, it, for, for many, they don't want to go on to universities, but we don't want to lose them through the gaps as well. Um, I know Diana's put her hand up as well. Um, Councillor, if I have permission, I'll hand it over to Diana because Diana did the report and she's got some really not good information that she'll be able to share with yourself on that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll go over to Diana and then uh, Ambrose, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we, we've circulated the, the, the report of the findings, but actually I just wanted to note um, uh, off the conversation that we had on the, on the report that we've commissioned, because it was an external uh, company that delivered the, the research, uh, one of the things that we were considering as part of Ealing Apprenticeship Partnership is the affordability of of apprenticeships. You know, some, some parents are reluctant to young people starting benefits uh, starting apprenticeships because of the impact on benefits so there's another thing to consider is the affordability um, of, of apprenticeships and and how that would impact not just an individual but the whole family uh, thank you and Ambrose now yeah um, just to respond to councillor Anand's question um, which is really really um, good one so if I unpack the work we're doing um, in schools uh, into in a bit more detail so firstly um, there's the strategic identification of schools that we think should be prioritised for our, for our engagement, not just in terms of their um, proximity to the HS2 line of route, but also based on a series of metrics. So, for example, um, female representation, ethnic minority representation, and also eligibility for free school meals as like a deprivation um, indicator. Um, and in terms of how far we go back, we go back to primary schools um, because we do feel that early engagement is really, really important. And then from that, intervening at key points for young person's education journey. So for example, before they make their choices about GCSE subjects, if we can give them some really good information and guidance around STEM, that will hopefully mean they're making a more informed choice at GCSE level that's linked to their career ambitions, taking that forward on to A-levels and then what they go on to do beyond that, whether it's going to university or an apprenticeship. So it's the key part, parts of the education journey to make sure that you've got a linear progression from education through to employment. That for us is the key thing that we can we can really do to help young people. And also in, in terms of what Billy said as well, when it comes to the fact that, you know, a young person in primary school today could be helping us to deliver HS2 in a few years time. It's that longitudinal piece as well, having those long-term relationships with schools so that we can 
demonstrate that impact that we are making is also something that's very important to us. Great, thanks very much. Uh, so last chance for questions. And uh, if there's no more questions, I'll move on to uh, recommendations. Um, I think there is a, a, a recommendation arising out of um, uh, the, the council should should uh, encourage schools to promote uh, apprenticeships more, including at primary um, level, uh, which is something that HS2 is doing. But I think that could be that could be done more broadly. Would there be agreement to that as a recommendation? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Um, the the, um, the yeah there was the, the the brief discussion we had about um, about tourism. Um, you know, I think there is work. There's more work that could be done to encourage um, tourism. You know, mindful of the jobs that tourism um, can create in the borough. I think there's work that um, can be done. Uh, well, it would be under it'd be under culture uh, in terms of, of of the relevant offices, Jan, and so on, wouldn't it? Uh, about promoting, um, I think of the wording, but, but I mean promote promote promoting tourism, you know, with an with an eye to uh, creating tourism jobs, uh, as opposed to just for 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 its own kind of cultural value. You you got a wording for that, yeah. Um, has anyone else got any thoughts of of recommendations that have arisen uh, either from discussions today or from the site visit we had? No. Okay. I'm just checking my own notes to see if I got any, noted anything else as possible recommendation, which requires me to have to read my own writing. But I don't think I did. Uh, so uh, in that case, thank you very much to uh, everyone who uh, presented and for the, uh, the members of the panel who asked questions. Uh, so we move on to item seven, the panel's work pan, uh, programme. Uh, so uh, as well as the details of the, the final meeting, uh, we also have um, a, a scheduled, uh, not scheduled yet, but a planned uh, site visit to various local businesses, which would be the idea would be a minibus uh, for panel members to go around and visit a number of uh, significant uh, employers on the same day, uh, which I think is a is a, is a valuable thing to do. Uh, Fiona, did you want to comment on that? Um, just to say that I think at the agenda planning for this scrutiny session, I, I offered to organise that for you. Um, so if we can get an indication of, of when you would like that, uh, we can plan it for the new year. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think February or March was what we were thinking of. Right. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a number of nods in the room, uh, so I think we would be able to have a reasonable number for a minibus. Okay. Well, sorry, what was that, Councillor Dinza? February and okay, a bid for, a bid for it to be in February. Right. Okay. Um, great. Okay. Well, we can organise that. I think that would be that would be very useful. Uh, talking talking directly to employers. Um, uh, so yeah, do we uh, do we agree the work program? Yeah, agreed. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, move on to date of next meeting, uh, which will be the last meeting of the panel, uh, and that will take place at seven o'clock on Wednesday, the third of March. Again, that will be a hybrid meeting. I think the physical part will be here again, won't it? Yes, yes, that's right. So, um, so thank you very much, and I'd just like to wish everyone. Uh,